So this study was taken um, following on the establishment of the Rural Youth Thematic Working Group. The Thematic Working Group on Youth is a group within the Global Donor Platform that is trying to mainstream the issues of the youth and have discussions with the youth and engage them along all processes in the develop in development process. Um, drawing on that, the, there was a, the way it evolved, it came from um, the last AGA, Annual General Assembly, in 2018 in Berlin that was co-hosted by BMZ and AFTB, where there was also a general consensus that to address the issues of the youth, um, donors need to actively engage them and have their say and, and include their say in the development process. So the, the study was trying to sort of identify the youth representatives for this youth group and then um, as a first step before we actually identified the representatives, we had to understand what kind of youth networks exist, where are they located, what do they do, what structures lie within these networks. So this is how the study came forward. Next slide, please. So maybe one may wonder why do youth join these networks? And there are various reasons um, depending on the type and structure of the networks. Some of these networks are created to create synergies, maybe to produce together or to market together or to access land together um, and do a lot of things. The other um, thing that stands out with these networks is that having the ability to share information. Most of the networks that we worked with um, worked a lot on online platforms like social media, like social media platforms like Facebook, um, Twitter, LinkedIn, and they have uh, these avenues where they share information about maybe calls for grants or opportunities um, or for funding and uh, different things are maybe about access to markets or maybe there's a bid somewhere so they use these platforms to share that. The other thing is that these networks work together to sort of um, achieve services like trainings or capacity developing for themselves. Some of these groups have actually gone on to purchase um, services like procure manufacturing um, services from different industries. The other thing is when the youth come together and they, con they convene, they have a convening power to push agendas, maybe at policy level, with governments, with um, or local policy makers. Then it also um, enables them to have um, social capital and peer mentoring. A lot of these young people have no one to learn from in their businesses, so they sort of come together to mentor each other, share challenges, and build on their social capital. Next slide, please. Um, so there are other networks that come together that are not really youth networks. So um, um, I think in 2017, a group of focus carried out a study of youth in networks in addition with the University in Netherlands and they, the study looked at youth in other networks and other cooperatives. So um, the youth found it very hard to join other cooperatives. The picture there is an extract from one of the studies and this gives you an example of the kind of requirements it would require for them to be in that part of that network. The own land, you need to pay membership fees, you need to have milk arrive on time. So many young people felt like they could not be in these networks. So in addition to the rigid um, entry requirements, um, many people found that uh, young people did not have a say in the decisions in the cooperatives. And uh, even when a cooperative maybe got an opportunity with a donor or a government and they were funded, the young people felt like they were left out and uh, the decisions were based on the board. Some of these people, um, some of these um, these cooperatives had what they would call maybe a youth advisory member, just one young person who would sort of be there to bring out uh, the voice of the youth, but this was not enough for them. The other option would be national youth councils, which are usually maybe with governments and local ministries, but so many young people consider these a checkbox, where people, they, they just do it, to just check a box and, and know that, hey, we have a youth, a, a youth on our panel, but actually they would not actually engage them or take their ideas to place. So these could be some of the reasons why youth decide to form their own independent networks. Next slide, please. So um, the, 
when we go into the classification of these networks, the literature around these networks is very scanty. There's not a lot of information about it. Much of the literature around youth networks is about um, youth in cooperatives. So these, it was really hard to sort of find this information and it's sort of like breaking ground. There are, however, various networks doing different things with different structures. Many of them have a common goal to maybe um, have a more prosperous business or have more prosperous youth chapters in their country, but their um, strategies differ and also their audiences differ and who they target. So we identified three main structures um, and we structured them regard, referring to their scope of work, the geographical scope of their operations, and other networks we found were affiliated to other institutions like the African Union. So these are the three networks we're going to be looking at in detail and with a few examples. Next slide, please. Um, so the first group of networks is a group, yeah, is a clarification of uh, networks that are working just for themselves. They come together to do production together, uh, maybe market together, and they carry out these activities together. Some of these groups actually own the land together where they work, and uh, they also are usually funded. The activities are funded by their own finance from the activities they do in production. A good case study here is the Chivwezi Hoti Premier Group, and it's a small group of 14 members. This story was, this, the story of these young people is interesting because they, they were formed from an initiative of IATA Youth, which uh, funded young entrepreneurs to sort of do work in groups and networks. So they started to be involved in production of vegetables and um, a, little, a bit of value addition, but they slowly evolved even when the project ended um, and they tried to maintain their work. Um, they caught the attention of different stakeholders and currently they are housed by the University of Nairobi. Just as I said, these people are mainly focused on production. Rarely do they go into talking to policy makers or maybe lobbying for a certain need, but they're just sort of working together. They have evolved so much, they have administrative systems and um, they actually offer um, internships and placements to, to students to sort of learn about agriculture. There are different networks like this that are spread out around the region. It may not be hard, very easy to find them and it may not be, they may not have high visibility on the internet, but they are there. One of the other organizations that was interesting was the Tomato and Orchard Producers Association of Nigeria, um, which does tomato processing and growing in Nigeria. So this is the first category of networks that we identified. Next slide, please. The other network that is sort of different is networks that are doing academia and scholarly work. So these networks are networks of agricultural professionals and they're not professionals in the sense that they, 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 they are professionals in the sense that they are not really involved into agricultural production, but they are graduates maybe with masters or PhDs and they are working to sort of show that um, even young people can be involved in agriculture in different things. So they, they, they have also commercial products like they, they are commissioned to carry out research for different institutions and uh, they, they are usually, they have a board that is composed of different scholars from different countries like this network which I'm going to tell you about, the Young African Researchers in Agriculture. Um, the famous scholar Ian Skuns is one of their board members. So they are a peer network of young and early career researchers um, they, they sort of work to build the capacity of the researchers and also contribute to the data gaps that are in the world in regards to agriculture. This network in particular has 150 researchers that are in 25 countries and they do a lot of topics where they, they deal with climate change, land governance and different other topics but in all the topics the young people are mainstreamed in all their themes. They are hosted currently by the University of Cape Town in Africa, but have micro offices and representatives in different regions. Um, they, all, they organize an annual researchers forum and where they publish some of this work and 
call on to policymakers to sort of engage with their work. And uh, such groups are not very common, but they do exist. One of the other networks that was interesting was the Tanzania Graduate Farmers Association, which is located in Tanzania. <clears throat> there are also a group of graduate farmers who work to generate data around agriculture in Tanzania. In addition, the Tanzania Graduate Farmers has also some another component where they sort of educate and train people to become professionals in agriculture and show them that young people can also be engaged in agriculture through, even if you're educated and you may not have maybe access to land, you can still engage with agriculture academically and contribute to its development. Next slide, please. <clears throat> this group um, is involved in lobby and advocacy, just as the name says. So these are groups that try to push, to push specific agendas with governments and policymakers. So they are, they are usually very focused on getting the attention of policymakers. So they are very large in numbers and have clearly laid out management structures. Given their nature that they are always trying to sort of get the attention of policymakers, they have a strong affiliation with governments and different pra practitioners. Um, to fund the activities, they are usually funded by donors. Uh, most of uh, what was surprising is some of these donors were not actually donors that are working in the agriculture and redevelopment space, but donors that are working in youth empowerment and um, sort of working with um, <clears throat> democracy-related issues to sort of get the agenda of young the agendas of young people involved in the development process. So the good example here was the Young Farmers Champions Network. So this network strives to get the voices and challenges of young people in agriculture in Uganda had. Um, they do a lot of activities on the side, but their main focus is lobby and advocacy. One of their um, highlights of, of, their, of their activities is the National Youth in Agriculture Manifesto of Uganda. And the process behind this is interesting because these young people go into different villages in Uganda and sort of harvest ideas. And these ideas are put into a manifesto that's launched and given to the policymakers. Um, and they, they give, a, this is done at their annual general assembly. So they've become a bit recognized and uh, they are a reference point for Ministry of Agriculture, the Ministry of Agriculture in Uganda in regards to youth programming. And they do a lot of work to sort of um, maybe connect uh, the, the ministry to different farmers in different regions. Um, they also have uh, other partners, like I think they have worked with the FAO on the Young, champ young Champions, Farmers Champions Initiative. So that is a kind of group. Another group that is also in Uganda that is doing something like that is the Uganda National Farmers Federation with a model that is almost similar like that. Another one is the African Initiative on Climate Change, Zambia. So we won't go into details into those, but that's just to give you an example of this. Next slide, please. The other group um, would be about youth empowerment. It's a bit similar to the previous group, but the major difference here is that that group, unlike the other group where the, the major audience is the government, the major audience of this group in particular would be the youth. So the model of this kind of network is to get youth involved in the issues that are affecting them. So many times young people are not very engaged in issues around them. They don't have information about climate change. They don't have information about issues that are affecting them. So these networks, they also, this, this kind of networks also work a lot on social media and they have a very large following. Um, they have core management teams, um, staff in place, um, and they're usually hosted by some kind of organization probably that is also working with youth empowerment. A good example here was the Youth Cafe in Kenya. So this is an organization, and to quote their words, they are the intersection point between young people and policy institutions' key activities. So they, one of the major things they do is to translate the facilitation of youth participatory democracy. And to do this, they, they translate information into formats that are friendly for youth and easy to understand. 
they do podcasts because um, they had a realization that in most parts of Kenya, most especially the rural areas, even if digitalization and ITC is spread, many people still do not have um, smartphones. They have basic phones, but everyone has a radio. So when they do these podcasts and they get these recordings, they share them on radio. Um, they've also worked to develop a Kenyan Youth Manifesto for the youth to sort of know what Another example of this is the Youth Agenda Trust in Zimbabwe, um, the Initiative for Green Africa, which focuses on sustainable agricultural practices, and the Young Farmers Initiative in, in Zambia. Next slide, please. Now, we could also class classify these networks in regards to their geographical location. So the first kind of networks work within the African continent. So these networks are very big and they have a following that keeps increasing because people keep joining them. Joining these networks is easy as maybe joining a link to a WhatsApp group, joining a Facebook page, or maybe following them on Twitter. That's how easy it is to join these networks and be part of them. They, most of them have well-built structures with secretariat functions and staff and they do their work like that. And uh, these networks are usually structured in country chapters. Um, just to mention a bit on these country chapters, the country chapters they, uh, they, they are diverse in the way they perform. Some of them are more active than the others. Some of them are more established than the others. In some cases, these country chapters are, are hosted by certain people by, or certain agencies, and this gives them sort of an edge to sort of be vibrant and more active. And they work with a lot of different topics in agriculture. Some of them work on access to markets. Some of them work on effects of climate change. So they work on different things. Then they also have very solid rec recognition from different stakeholders. Some of these networks have become reference points for donors. When you go to forums, you see representatives of these networks as they're being invited to come and participate in discussions with policymakers. Mm. So a good example we chose here was the Af Africa Youth in Agribusiness Association, which is based in Chad, is headquartered in Chad, but they have a lot of activities that are carried out online. They have, just as I said, they have different focal points across different countries. But one of their main forms of communication is through WhatsApp groups. So they promote uh, continental cross-learning and collaboration. I am actually on the page of this network, and they share a lot of information about maybe webinars like this or information about grants and donors and such different things. So there are different other networks like this. Um, that are just clarified, classified on the geographical location, like the African Youth Initiative still on climate change, and maybe CADAP Youth Network. Um, next slide, please. Again, during on geographical clarifications, we have networks that work within the country. So these the, the networks within these countries are mainly focused within the countries. And many of them are usually affiliated with governments. This could be mainly because some of these networks that we talked to um, started out, they evolved out of national youth councils where the youth sort of decided to, to draw away and do their own thing. So um, these networks, what is interesting is that they have other grassroots networks tying into them and they sort of create a voice for these other networks. They usually require membership subscriptions and subscriptions, and this also varies. Some of the networks, you could still be a member, but when you pay a membership subscription, you'd get some maybe special services or unique benefits. Maybe you get to be on the board that makes decisions. Um, they operate with democratic structures. Most of them hold annual general meetings where they sort of set their agenda and elect leaders. And their structures are very highly functional, probably because they work within the government or work within other stakeholders. So here we we would, we would look at the Botswana Young Farmers Association. So they are an organization that has a following of over 5,000 young farmers in, in Botswana along different value chains. And just as I mentioned, these 
Botswana Young Farmers Association provides a convening point for other networks to sort of engage into the discussions with them. We have an annual Young Botswana Forum where they, they have a two, three day event where they sort of, they would have identified training needs and they train young farmers and different people and then they have an AGM where they select um, their leaders and approve their developed agendas. And they are very legally registered and follow the correct structures. Other youth, other youth networks in this category were like the Namibia Youth Farmers, Young Farmers Association. Um, the difference with the Namibia Young Farmers Association is that it runs a lot online. They, the most, much of their work is on their Facebook page. There is also the Rwanda Youth in Agribusiness Forum, which has a very big capacity to converge other networks in Rwanda, and then the National Young Farmers Network in Cameroon. Next slide, please. Then as we are still on geographical clarifications, there are networks that operate outside Africa. They have offices and representation outside Africa, but they have very strong factors, um, chapters in Africa. Here we'll just we'll look at two networks, the Young Professionals for Agriculture Research and Development and the Climate Smart Agriculture Youth Network. So these networks have a lot of characteristics like the former networks like that we looked at, like the AYA, but what differentiates these ones is that they are not really based in Africa. So the young professionals in agriculture research for development, for example, is hosted by the by the GFAR in in Rome, but they have a very strong representation in different regions of Uganda. A lot of the activity I mean sorry of Africa, a lot of the activities are carried out online. Um, they have a very interactive website with a lot of knowledge information, knowledge and information for young people. The Climate Smart Agriculture Youth Network is also another one of these. They are, their focus currently is, I think, on sensitization of youth in the SDG processes. They have actually have an, had an initiative that have translated SDGs into different local languages um, in Africa to sort of get the youth involved in these things. But they do take on, however, other activities like coordinate trainings and participate in policy discussions. And so that is just those networks that are very strong in Africa, but they are located outside Africa. Then the other is, uh, networks that are associated with institutions like the CADAP Youth Network, the a AU EU Youth Envoys that are supposed to promote collaborative learning between youth in different um, countries. Next slide, please. So we'll now go into the the challenges that these different youth networks face. As you can see, we tried to, to to present them in a way in which which challenges they identified were the biggest challenges. Non surprisingly, the the biggest challenge was operational resources. Now the networks identified different challenges um, with with regards to operational resources. One of the things that showed up was maintaining sort of secretariat functions, most especially for the large networks. To have an office where would, which would be an address for them where they would do their work it was hard to maintain. This was because many of these big networks do not take in membership subscriptions. So it is hard to raise revenue unless you probably maybe get a grant or are funded by someone to maintain it. This also was the same case with um, this was also the same case with having dedicated staff um, and also financing some of the activities like training and even to have finances to maybe travel to a conference to participate in something. That also was one of the issues <clears throat> that was raised. A lot of these networks are funded by these bigger networks are funded by donors, but many of them ex experienced that uh, share the experience that these, uh, the funding is not consistent, and uh, the priorities of the donors sometimes change, and they choose to do other things. So, this is one of the challenges that that was highlighted. The other issue that came up was a lack of political support. Um, which was a bit surprising, but so many of these networks expressed that they are not recognized by practitioners or 
by governments. They just see them as sort of a separate entity there. In some extreme cases, these networks were seen to antagonize governments and um, they were victimized for trying to push agendas for youth inclusion. So many of them sort of pulled back. In some cases, this actually hindered them to expand their membership to get other young people. Um, the other thing that could also fall in here is that uh, uh, many political governments have not really given um, structures to formalize networks. So if you have a network and maybe you would like to register it to sort of get away from being informal, there's, there's no way to register it. You'd have to register it maybe as, a, as an NGO or something which would be different. Yeah. So the other challenge that that came up as access to information and cross-networking. Because many of these networks are not exposed, some of these networks are located in very rural areas, it is very hard for them to access information, whether on the internet or to be recognized when there's a project or to sort of get in touch and learn from other networks. So a lot of these networks do not know what is going on. And during the conversations would have, would you'd find similarities and maybe you'd share them with them that, hey, I know you you talked, you said you're doing this, this network is also doing this, and even if the network is within the country, these networks would not know that there's someone else doing that. So that is also one of the other challenges that came up. The other thing that showed up was technical guidance. These networks sometimes start as small networks with maybe 20 people, but with time, people express interest and they join. So many people experienced um, a challenge in managing this expansion, but how do you sort of manage the fact that more people are joining you? How do you uh, strategically plan for that? And how do you make a budget or come up with a budget to finance that and, um, and have the skills to do that? So this was also another major challenge that showed up. Um, the other challenge that showed up was avenues for participation where the networks for, for like they were not invited to anywhere to maybe participate in, in events or be part of um, a poli policy dialogue. This is this especially showed up for networks that were involved in maybe lobby and advocacy. So there is nowhere for them to voice their concerns or sort of showcase their work. Then the other thing that, sh that showed up was the mindsets of the young people. One is said that um, networks are, are considered to be uh, like the old, if you, if you could say something background, like how people used to be in cooperatives. So many uh, young people still have an autonomous mindset and they do not want to join the, the youth networks. Most especially when there's um, a subscription fee involved. This could either be the mindset or it could actually be that they simply cannot afford it. But this is something that the young people expressed. Other things that came up were related to operations of their agriculture activities like lack of access to land, lack of production technologies, climate change, and also maybe a bit of social constraints like gender. Next slide, please. So um, we're now going to some recommendations on how practitioners can better effectively engage with the networks. Um, practitioners need to understand the diversity of networks, especially in regards to structures and the composition. It is good to understand what kind of people are involved in these networks and how are they structured, and also what kind of um, um, what kind of the structures would mean things like legal registration. How are they registered? Can they be funded with that way? Because some of so many times um, some of these youth networks have kept on evolving in structures and changing their composition because maybe there's a, a grant that has been offered to them and they need some kind of requirements. So it is better to understand what kind of structures these these youth networks are composed of. Then when donors do that, then they can match their program with these networks. As I mentioned, many of these networks have kept on changing from being just informal networks to being NGOs to registering as businesses to registering as different things. And uh, when, I, when you go into deep insights to ask them why this happened, many of them did this, in, did this to chase opportunities and find grants. So I think this is the kind of pressure that could sort of um, distract their attention from what they were intent, intended to do. 
then there is also a need to study the structures of these networks more to answer questions about the st power structures within these networks. It would be good to understand who in these networks, for example, when you have a network of a thousand people, how much do the voices of uh, people at the lower level get get up get higher? It is known. It is evident that sometimes when you go to these conferences, you see the same faces, or when you see um, at any arena for participation, you see the same faces. How sure can we be that this is what happens? How sure we can we be that the voices of the people below are heard? <clears throat> so this is also something that needs to be studied more and understood more. Then there's a challenge of finding these networks, first of all. Like what we, the, the methodology we used was you just going through online searches. And uh, technically what that would mean if someone doesn't have the, the, the terms youth network or youth association in their name, you may not be able to find them. So donors could enhance efforts to increase the visibility of these, of these networks. And this could be through maybe creation of a database with these networks that are doing different things. And so that practitioners could easily find these networks. And I, I don't know if anyone has had some experience with trying to find networks here, but it is not really easy. And you sort of come up with the same maybe 10 networks that are available. Next slide, please. Yeah, then donors could facilitate the engagement of these networks uh, through creating advo advisory councils with, um, within these, um, within their, their activities. I'm not blowing my trumpet, but a good example is a rural youth thematic working group where the, we've created something like this that you can continuously engage with the, with the young people. And when we invite these networks and we have a diverse mix of these different networks, then we can actually invest youth voices that, um, that are diverse and quite unique. Then the other thing is to increase the relevance of these networks, most especially to the governments. Many governments do not recognize these networks or when they push agendas. So there should be support to sort of know that these networks are relevant and they are valid and what they are doing is correct. So these, these need to be in recommendations that maybe advise donors that are in, ad, into advising governments should do. They should advise governments to sort of recognize these youth networks as they offer a good convening point for different young people. And then the other thing that needs to happen is some of these networks need to come together. I think the, the country, I think it, it was in Ghana, there were networks, about 10 networks that were all doing the same things. They, there were almost no differences in what they are doing, but they didn't know about what other networks were there. And I think maybe if some of these people could harmonize their efforts, they could sort of be able to push their agendas easier and it could also be um, cost them less to do whatever they want to do. So we could, donors could sort of facilitate such actions maybe through having forums for these people to meet once in a while. I think this could go a long way into also helping them achieve the activities. Then finance, as usual, it needs to actually, uh, donors need to finance these networks. Even if they cannot be financed, you could offer maybe um, to host secretariat functions or finance some of the operations. In studying these networks, the most successful youth networks have been hosted by some people, have been hosted by a relevant organization that can sort of provide the, the funding for them and they do not have to sort of, in addition to struggling, maybe for example, to pushing the agenda, they do not have to struggle to find a host. Then the other thing would be to build the technical capacity of the leaders within these networks. Many of them identify the challenge of not having the skills and knowledge to, for example, manage expansion and do strategic plans. So these could be the, the development partners could organize trainings in such areas to enable these young people have these skills. Then the other thing is to create arenas for these networks to showcase their work. The few examples I've showed you are just a tip of the iceberg, but uh, the iceberg, but these um, networks have done very many different things and have, um, have uh, um, impacted very many lives. So it would be good to create arenas to facilitate these networks to showcase their work to the world and maybe that will increase their recognition and they'll be 
considered as a relevant part of the development process. Next slide, please. Okay, thank you very much. I'll hand it back to Oliver. Right now, thank you. Thank you very much, James, for this very comprehensive and actually fantastic overview of youth networks in Africa. I'm sure you have much more material to share with us, and we could easily spend another hour or two hours on that issue, but um, looking at the time, it means um, I would like to open the floor for your questions and uh, comments, as we are, have the privilege of having James right here and uh, being able to answer all of your questions you have. So. Please unmute your microphones and um, yeah, ask your questions. Um, I would like to ask a question, but I don't want to jump ahead of the queue. Yeah. Could you could you please indicate who, who you are because we don't see that, and could you just say who you are and what background yeah, you have? Sorry. Yeah, that's great. Um, so my name is Thomas Fisher. I work with the uh, department uh, called WCDI, the Wageningen Centre for Development Innovation at Wageningen University in Research in the Netherlands. Thank you. Okay. So what, what... and uh, and sorry to clarify my my role. I'm, my title is Youth and Gender Advisor and Food System. So this is very relevant for for the work that I'm doing. <coughs> So I had uh, my first question is um, what came up really clearly for me. Um, is that it sounds like any work with um, the donors, but also for uh, practitioners like myself, because I support a lot of uh, work support on um, youth uh, in a number of African countries, is really to actually um, build on what's there rather than trying to set up something new. Um, and really work on the recognition of what they're already doing and building on that, um, because it sounds like there's a lot, uh, a far richer amount of initiatives um, that are going on than, than even I was aware of. Um, I was wondering um, whether you have some good examples of how some of these platforms have been recognized and pushed up um, and how that, that's made a difference. Um, I have a second follow-up question, but I can ask afterwards. That's fine. No, you know, um, uh, thank you, Thomas, for your question. Um, I think you're calling in from uh, uh, with the phone, and the, the line is um, we we heard you, but not so clearly. I think what I understood is that you wanted to ask whether uh, uh, platforms are, or networks are recognised by the government, and whether this has an effect on how they operate, or because it, it didn't. Uh, was not too clear. The line is a bit weak. Sorry. Could you okay. misunderstood? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Is this any clearer? It's better. Yeah. Okay. So my question was: um, It sounds like there's a really rich amount of networks that already exist, and so therefore, um, uh, trying to promote them, the donors to promote them and get them recognised by government uh, within their country is far more important than trying to set up something new. Um, I was wondering whether there are any good examples that, uh, that you happen to know about that would that, that, uh, uh, that showcase a good example of this, that, for instance, where a donor has worked with a platform to help uh, promote it, it, its visibility and recognition um, so that it becomes more recognized but at a regional or national scale. Um, thank you. Um, so the, the question is whether there are any good examples where where there have been recognition of these networks and they've gone on to be recognized. I think um, if, if that's a question, one of the examples that I've seen is the Yofkan uh, that I shared, which is in Uganda, which has designed the the, the, the Uganda Youth Manifesto. This organization evolved out of uh, an intervention that with FAO that recognized youth champions. And I think this is someone, one of the reasons that currently they are recognized by the Ministry of Agriculture as one of the, the, the key reference points in youth programming. So I think that is one of the, the, the good examples. Other organizations that have 
been recognized, for example, the Botswana Young Farmers Association have also done work with different donors. For example, I think the Botswana Young Farmers Association has worked with GIZ on a project to map out uh, youth in, in, in agriculture in Botswana. So such such initiatives just even when, for example, local governments know that this has been done and with this youth network, that would give them a strong validation on that they are a valid network that can sort of do something very yeah, professional. I don't know if that answers your question. Thomas, did this answer your question? And in addition, you said you had a second question as well. Thomas, we can't hear you. Excuse me. Uh, maybe you're still muted. Could you? No, we don't hear him. So, well, I hope, uh, Thomas, when you're back, uh, just, um, well, contact us and, um, well, ask your question. Uh, apart from that, um, are there any more questions or comments? Yeah, Thomas will. He says he's typing in a question. Okay. Hmm. Okay. He said that helped his answer, answering his question. Okay. And there was a second question, Thomas, that you also wanted to address. Oliver. Yes. Do you hear me? Yes, I do. Yes. Hello. Um, I'm Sven Braulik, working with the GIZ sector project on rural employment with a focus on youth. Um, yeah, James. Um, Thanks a lot for um, the nice presentation, structuring the networks, and believe me, um, I do understand how difficult it is to, to find out about um, networks, and you always end up um, with um, the same usual suspects, and also the, the networks, as you said, are always changing, yeah? um, and sometimes I'm wondering, um, how long are these networks around? Are they still active or not? Um, so thanks a lot for the overview. Um, question from my side is, um, you rightfully mentioned that um, these networks um, very often also lack this information about other networks. Um, one country you mentioned, there were 10 networks you identified and they almost did uh, the same thing in, in one country. Um, what I found interesting, though, is um, when you mentioned the uh, different types of networks, there was one um, category with the country networks. You said that um, here um, the, these networks are strongly tied um, with other networks, and you gave examples um, from Namibia and Botswana, the Young Farmers Association. Um, I'd be interested if you can say a couple of more words um, about these networks and those two countries specifically. Um, Botswana, you mentioned 5,000 members. How well are um, they organized? How well are they connected in the respective countries? Thank you. Thank you, Sven. Yes. James. Thank you very much, Sven. Um, so um, maybe I'll start with to talk about the Botswana Young Farmers Association. So this network has other networks that tie into it. And um, I think most of these networks are um, small producer networks that may not really have um, such a say or maybe a higher level of education from the people. And um, as I mentioned in the last part, that it, they still need to do more research in how these structures, how the structures operate. From the interview with the, the head of the association, she said they do consultative meetings with the, these different young farmers in the different regions and the networks, and they come up with a strategic plan which is approved at the, their annual Botswana Young Farmers Forum. There is a need to, however, validate how much of um, how much of the ideas are echoed and from which regions exactly in Botswana. So the, 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 there are some of that there are some different gaps um, in, data, in the data relating to such, 
fat structures. But they are very well structured and they, um, they have an office and they are very recognized with, um, within the government. So I could tell you that. But to the extent to which these other networks tie in, I can't go behind a, a concrete answer with that. Then you, you asked about the Namibia Young Farm Association. The Namibia Young Farm Association is mainly an online platform. So this is, they, they do not really go on to sort of push agendas, but their work is more about sharing this information on Facebook. And when you join the Facebook page, you could sort of share your ideas, raise your questions, and or maybe um, pick up some of the opportunities that are posted. So their, 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 their goals may not really be to push agendas, but for the purpose of sharing information, the, the association, I think, with those structures and, and of having a Facebook page, they can easily serve that purpose. Yeah. Okay, thank you, James. So, and did this answer your question? Okay. Um, yeah, did this answer your question? Or? Yes, just uh, quickly unmuting. Um, yes, thanks a lot. Um, that answered my question, and um, I think you know um, why I'm asking because um, we will um, support um, national youth dialogue platform meetings in three countries, and two of them are yeah, Namibia and Botswana. So we're looking forward to also contacting um, the networks that you identified. Thank you. That's Oh, that's okay. great. Thank you. Now, uh, Thomas uh, typed uh, his second question. I, I may just read that. Um, so he wants to know, um, has there been real impact that you have seen on helping more rural, lower educated youth? His experience, or Thomas' experience, is that it's a real challenge to reach them rather than more urbanized, higher educated groups. James. Yeah. Um, I, I can't I can't say if there has there has been real impact, but I can I can I do know that there is a challenge in reaching them. Um, in my study, I did talk to 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 someone who works within an NGO in Malawi, and I they shared with me these contacts of these youth networks. And uh, when they shared that the contacts, they shared with me names, and I asked, could I have email addresses? And they said that. Um, they said that no, they do not have email addresses, or you, 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 so you can't you can't reach them. You need to call them. But then she said, actually, even if you call them, they may not be able to to communicate with you very fluently in English. So I think to sort of empower these networks, um, the policies need to sort of shape, sort of um, come down from the top level and sort of maybe go into. Um, having empowerment programs in different local languages, so they need to sort of triple down that it may not really be that you live invite these networks to a forum in in maybe um, Europe or somewhere and, and and get their ideas, but if they have maybe meetings within themselves where they could maybe have this idea, I think then you can sort of empower them in that way. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are there any more questions? We are almost coming to the end. It's Almost four o'clock. However, we can take one more question, if there is one. And um, I see no nothing in the chat box. So I'm asking again. Um, Oliver. Yes. Then this is one again. Yes, okay. me again. Uh, another quick one. Um, the um, Cut Up Youth Network. Um, James, you mentioned uh, um, on at least uh, on two slides. Um, did you have contact um, with them um, and any update on what are they currently doing? Um, how well they are set up now with their country chapters and how well connected are they? Um, with the with the other networks. Um, I thank you, Finn. I I did not have direct contact with CADAP, but uh, there was a webinar.
they they have lost existence and how to get more youth involved in the CADA processes. Um, I think in that webinar they shared some details and I could share some. I, I don't know if you. I think you actually also part of that one, but I could share some of the information from there. But uh, we will have more contact with them as the study is not yet done, and with as the full report will come, we'll have more conversations with them and we'll know how far they were, they are with their progress. Okay, thank you, um, and we will also share with you. Um, information we get from the CADAP Youth Network um, since they will also partner up for the youth dialogue platforms. Thank you very much. We'll appreciate that. Okay, thank you. There's one more question about the full report. The, the full report is not yet complete and it will be shared probably by the end of November. Then it will have uh, End of end of November, and it will have a full list of all other networks, even those that have not been in in, in this presentation. I'll hand it back to Oliver now. Thank you, James.